Okay, good morning, Compass Christian Church. Good to see you all. We're going to get started here with this song called The House of the Lord, and it is very joyful. So feel free to joyfully sing, and however you want to do that, whether that's with your voice or that's just dancing or on your seat, whatever. Um, but if you please join us and stand, we're going to get started here. Let's play. 
Well, good morning. Welcome back. All right, we're talking about kingdom justice this morning, and we are on our sixth sermon in the sermon series, and this is a long series. Like I said, we're going to take 12 weeks. So at the end of today's sermon, we will be halfway through. How are we feeling so far? Are we feeling pretty good? All right. So, so far in the series, we've seen that the kingdom of God simply defined is the reign and rule of God. And we've seen that the fullness of the kingdom coming, like Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the fullness is when he comes back and restores the earth and the heavens. And then we also saw that we've been seeing that the kingdom can be experienced uh, today in an anticipatory sense uh, through the spirit. That's sort of how it happens through kingdom uh, ethics, how we behave in the world how God wants us to live, and through our mindset of kingdom citizenship. So we're continuing through our topical part of the series. Last week we kicked that off with kingdom power. And so today we'll be looking at kingdom justice across the Bible. So again, we're going to have uh, have justice sort of banded across the whole Bible. And so as we do this, we're going to look at the bad news related to justice, the good news in the ultimate sense, and then what Uh, we can do to live God's justice today. So what is the bad news with respect to justice? I think it's helpful for us to start by defining our terms. Uh, In the English language, uh, here's one definition from dictionary.com, or a couple actually of definitions. It says the quality of being just, righteousness, equitableness, or moral rightness, just treatment of all members of society, the administering of deserved punishment or reward. So are we seeing those things in a global sense today? No. All right. So even in English, we see, okay, justice doesn't work. Well, what about the Hebrew word for justice, uh, which is mishpat? Uh, That's sort of fun to say. If you want to say it with me, mishpat. (laughs) Mishpat. All right. I don't know. Did I say that right, Anna? Close enough? Close enough. All right. Anna's our Hebrew expert here. So, (laughs) Well, just like our English word, it has a wide range of meaning. It can mean judgment, uh, usually in a legal sense. It can mean justice as an attribute of God. We think of God as being just. Uh, It can be a law, a legal decision, a legal right, and there's sometimes smaller usages as well. So in simple words, justice is about bringing God's wisdom and his perspective uh, to bear at the situation at hand, whether it's a legal situation or whether it's a personal one. And as we're going to see this morning, Uh, God's justice uh, looks sort of surprising. We would think it might look one way, but really the way that it looks, or at least the way that it gets described in Scripture frequently, is as things like taking care of the poor, taking care of the outcast, the the widow, the orphan, the least of these. Uh, That's what justice looks like from a biblical perspective. Now, we're not going to get the chance to talk about everything the Bible says about justice. Justice is probably one of the biggest themes in the Bible. And so I encourage you to, if you, if you want to, uh, to take some of the verses that we're going to look at today. Uh, if you have a tool like Blue Letter Bible, you can find this word mishpat. You can click on it, and it'll show you literally all the occurrences in the Old Testament. And I encourage you to go through that exercise and see if what I'm describing about justice is accurate or not. And if it's not, come find me uh, sometime in the future. I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation, and we can, we can talk about that. So... So again, if we look around at the world today, do we see justice? No. And I think it's remarkable, we're here in America uh, in the year 2023, and I think it's remarkable that even we would answer this this way, 
Because you think about the circumstances, for example, that the Apostle Paul went through during his life in ministry under the Roman Empire with the rules and regulations that he had to deal with. And it seems like that was way less just than what we have today. Would you agree with that? And so even in our modern time, even with the country that we live in, with our system of government, uh, with our legal system, uh, it, are the things perfect in the United States in modern times? No, justice is still not perfect. And that looks like um, the guilty going free, which happens, right? That looks like the just being punished, which also really unfortunately happens. Um, so we are not the only society uh, that has seen injustice, though. We have to recognize that, that things might be better for us today than they have been for people in the past, but uh, it's still not where God wants it to be. So in the Bible, it's really interesting because the first big kingdom uh, that we find in the Bible is the kingdom of Egypt. And the Bible Project, when talking about the gospel of the kingdom, had something really interesting to say about Egypt. Egypt as a kingdom and what they were built on. And uh, I wanted to share this quote with you because I think it's really important. Uh, what uh, Tim Mackey, if you go listen to the whole thing, what he's saying is he's talking about how the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt uh, during the time of Moses, uh, is not named. And one of the things that Tim Mackey says about that is he says, I think one of the reasons that might be the case is because he is a typical foreign king in the Bible. In other words, he is a type. What, is a, what does a foreign king look like? That's what this pharaoh is meant to be. It's, it doesn't matter if it's this pharaoh or that pharaoh, the third pharaoh. He is sort of like typified as a foreign king. And the whole nation of Egypt actually gets typified throughout the Bible as well as a foreign nation as an, uh, in opposition to God and God's kingdom. And this is what they had to say about that. It says, they said in, in episode two of the Gospel of the Kingdom podcast, it says, and it, Egypt, is a typical human kingdom. That's what they mean by typical. They mean it's a type. It is a, 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 a perfect example of what a human kingdom looks like. And then he goes on to say, it's about national security. It's about economy. And those two things justify the enslavement of a whole people group. We're talking about the Hebrews. Killing their babies to make stores or storehouses and cities. It's the first human full-scale kingdom, and it thrives on what? Injustice. And so we see the Bible portraying Egypt as a system of injustice. And so in direct contrast to that is God's calling of Israel as a nation out of Egypt and trying to set it up on what then? Justice, the opposite of injustice. So God called Israel to be a nation to exemplify the opposite of what we see in Egypt. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Amos chapter 5. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about, uh, we know that we yearn for justice. I think we understand that the bad news today is there is no justice in a true, full sense. And so we yearn for that. And so I want to spend a little bit of time um, dealing with is how did the righteous of the Old Testament people view this same problem? How did they yearn for justice? And in Amos, uh, we're in a situation where um, it's approximately 750 B.C., uh, he's in the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern ten tribes. The kingdom has been divided for a couple hundred years at this point. And they are very soon going to be taken over by the nation of Assyria. And so this is not a great time. Well, it is a great time. From the outside perspective, it looks like Israel is very prosperous. But they're about to head into a very dark period of time. And God is calling prophets to bring them back to the, the standard that God wants them to have. And Amos, from basically the beginning to the end, is about justice. It's about this theme of doing right by people who are uh, in lower situations in life. And what we're going to see is some really interesting language here about uh, what happens with the gate and what the elders at the gate. And in that time, that was, their, that was where they did law. That was, where they, that was their, like a courtroom. People like the elders would sit at the gate and people would come to them with their problems and say, hey, can you deal with this property situation or can you deal with this situation? The elders would be at the gate listening and offering advice and they were speaking in that context on behalf of God. That was their responsibility. And what we see here in Amos is there were many people that were uh, perverting that. And God took that very seriously in Amos chapter 5 verse 10. It says, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. 
so uh, there's, some, there's some debate on exactly who the theys and the hymns are, but whatever it is, there are a group of elders at the gate who are, um, are doing bad things, and then there, are may, there may be someone speaking out. Either they're an elder or there's someone else who's speaking out against this misapplication of justice, and they're sort of being beaten up and shouted down. Verse 11, this is very interesting language here. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. So what we see here is an economy that has been built on winners and losers. And the people who are doing well, they have really nice houses, they have really nice vineyards, but they've gotten there because they are subjugating people. They're putting people, they're trampling people under their feet. And that is the poor. In verse 12, it continues, For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy in the gate. So needy people were coming to them saying, pleading their cause, saying, look, this is unjust, please help us. And the elders were ignoring it because they were taking bribes. Verse 13, Therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. So the prudent here, it, it's the idea that like there's so much momentum going this evil direction that no one can really fight against it. Um, it's, it's so far gone. So God's response to this is in verse 14 and 15. This is what God says about it. He says, Seek good and not evil, that you may what? Live. And so the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, the God of hosts will be with you, as you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice, mishpat, in the gate that it, it may be that the Lord, Yahweh, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So Amos has been warning this group of people that this disaster was going to come, that this other nation was going to come in and take them over. And he's saying, look, if you want to live, we need to start pushing this back toward where God wants. And God is talking about justice here. This is the problem with national Israel in this moment, is they are not seeking justice. They're not executing justice. Think about that. When we think about like obeying God or doing what God wants us to do, how high do we put seeking justice on that list? But here in Amos, it's number one. It's number one. And so uh, the other thing I think is interesting too is that in verse 15, it says it may be that Yahweh will be gracious. It doesn't say even if they do all these things, they may be so far gone that Assyria may still come in and take them over. But anyway. So the picture here is, is that we have injustice being done at the gate, and this is what God thinks about that. Um, another example of this is in Isaiah 59, if you want to take a look at that. Um, Elizabeth Actermeyer, in the Understanding the Bible commentary on the Minor Prophets, said this, and I thought it was incredibly insightful. She said, quote, The Israelite was commanded to love the Lord, Deuteronomy 6.5. That's a common verse we all know. As is the Christian... And that's, then she quotes Mark 12, 30 in the parallels. Jesus talks about loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But part of that love is to be exercised by justice towards one's neighbor, as Deuteronomy so vividly spells out throughout its pages. And as Jesus emphasized when he joined the second great commandment to the first, Mark 12, 31 in parallels. The second commandment is, thou shalt love your neighbor, what? As yourself. Uh, if you're going to do that, you're going to be executing justice in the gate, right? This is the age-old tradition present from the, first, uh, present from the first in biblical faith, which Amos recalls in verses 14 and 15 here. So there's this idea that loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself are two sides of the same coin, and that justice is right in the middle of it. And so that, I think, tells me something else about what's going on here. When we say, when we talk about the attributes of God, one of the important attributes of God is God is love, right? We think about that all the time. God is love. God is love. We also say that God is just, right? He is a just God. He always does what's right. He always does what uh, we would want uh, him to do from a purely objective situation. If we had all the information that he had, we would see that it is absolutely right, right? And I think what we have to do is understand that God being love and God being justice are two sides of the exact same coin. And therefore, our response to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength in the first commandment and the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself are also two sides of the same coin. And justice is integral to both of those things. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah speaks to uh, us from 200 years later. Now it's the southern kingdom's turn to be taken over. <laughs> and he is warning the southern kingdom about the same thing. 
that Amos did 200 years before him. And we're going to see uh, something interesting here in Jeremiah that we didn't see in Amos. And that is we tend to view idolatry as the worst thing that, that God deals with throughout the Old Testament time. And we're going to see that the idea of idolatry and the idea of injustice go hand in hand. And, we'll, and it's not just here in Jeremiah. We'll see that too. But in Jeremiah 1, we'll start reading here. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, stand in the gate of Yahweh's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of Yahweh, all you men of Judah, who enter these gates to worship Yahweh. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. That sounds a little bit like what Amos was saying. <laughs> Right? I mean, like they're about to be taken over. And he's saying, you know, hey, if you turn back, this might work out for you. Verse 4, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. So what was happening apparently here in Jeremiah's time is they saw the trouble approaching. They saw on the horizon there were these powers that were interested in coming and taking over Judah. And what they were saying is, oh, we're in Jerusalem. We've got the temple. We've got the presence of God. We're totally good. God's going to protect us no matter what we do. And so they're chanting, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They're trying to sh- drown out what Jeremiah is warning them with, with, hey, look, the chicane is here. God's here. We're okay. We're going to be fine. Which one was right? Yeah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was right. Let's keep going. Verse 5. For if, tr- if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly what? execute justice one with another if you do not oppress the sojourner the fatherless or the widow or shed innocent blood in this place so he's relating that to you know murders like the worst injustice right and if you do not go what after other gods to your own harm then i will let you dwell in this place in the land i gave you of old to your fathers forever so in the same breath he talks about executing justice for the poor for the widow for the fatherless for the sojourner he talks about idolatry hand in hand. Because if you do love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. Idolatry and justice go opposite ways. If you are an idolater, you will not do justice. So you have to follow God and you have to pursue justice. That's what we're called to do as Christians, as followers of God. So, I think, too, about how Jesus' ministry looked like this. Because when Jesus was out ministering to people, who was he bringing into the fold that were, had been shut out by the Pharisees and the Sadducees? It was the downcast. It was the women. It was the slave. It was the poor. It was the people who were looked less on. It was the leper who no one wanted to come close to or even get, get close to, much less touch, and he touched him. That's the kind of ministry that Jesus ran. He ran a ministry of justice. And he says in Matthew 19, the last shall be first and the first last. This is what it's talking about. And I want to point out here that Jesus would, and I think Jesus would absolutely agree with this. There's nothing morally good about being poor. I'm not using poor in like a universal sense. We're talking about the righteous poor. We're talking about the poor who still follow Yahweh, the poor who still endure in their faith. And we're going to see that in the New Testament applications later. Idolatry and justice are often spoke together, and I think it's because of this tie that Akramar pointed out between the first two commandments. And so on the screen here, we've got three examples of that. We have Ezekiel 18, we've got Micah 3, and we've got Deuteronomy 16. And so I encourage you to take a look at all three of those uh, later if you want to see them in more detail. But idolatry and injustice, they absolutely go hand in hand. So that's the bad news. (laughs) The bad news is there is no justice right now. Uh, What is the good news in an ultimate sense? What is the good news in a final sense? Uh, Well, we've seen clearly that God's will is for the less fortunate to be cared for and not to be taken advantage of. So what do you think is going to happen when Jesus comes back? (laughs) They're going to be taken care of. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 shows a little about this hope from an Old Testament perspective. This is a a prophecy of the Messiah. And here in Jeremiah chapter 23, he sort of handles both sides of it, the bad side and the good side. So in verse 1 it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh, for thus says 
the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares Yahweh. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back into their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, uh, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall do what? Execute justice and righteousness, which we're going to talk about next week, in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Yahweh is our righteousness. So here we have the future Davidic king setting everything right again in an ultimate sense. And here we also find that when that happens, the ones who were shepherds, who did this stuff, who perverted justice in the gate, who took advantage of the poor people, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to be excited when Jesus comes back? <laughs> so what this means is this future concept of Jesus Christ returning, it is not good news for everyone. It is good news for those of us who are following Christ. It is good news for the righteous of the Old Testament. It is good news for those who are downcast and are still committed to God, who have, been, who have been pushed aside and who still follow after God, it is not good news for those especially who abuse the poor, especially if they were in Israel. And I think uh, that there's a deep part of us who, uh, who absolutely love us. There's a deep part of us that really yearns for this kind of justice, this po poetic justice. And think about the times where you've like watched a movie uh, and there's this, this bad guy all throughout the movie, like, you know, Die Hard and Hans Gruber, and he's doing all this dumb stuff, right? And he's, you know, uh, hurting people and, you know, all, this, all these different things. And at the end, you know, John McClane gets his man and he gets Hans Gruber, right? And so you think about all these different movies we've watched, a lot of them sort of go the same way, right? There's poetic justice at the end because we all what? We all crave that. We all love that kind of a storyline. And this is the greatest example of that. If you like poetic justice, you can also look at Isaiah 13. Uh, and if you want to look at other descriptions of the righteous king, uh, Psalm 72, Isaiah 16, and Isaiah 42 are three more examples of that. Uh, if you want to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to see it from Paul's perspective. And Paul's going to use a term here that we actually were first introduced to last week. It's this term called the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord frequently refers to uh, Jesus Christ's returning. And if you look at the Old Testament usages of this phrase, the day of the Lord, I'm going to say like 80% of them are negative. Like it's like the day of the Lord's going to come and then people are going to get like killed. <laughs> you know, like there's going to be a bad end. And it's always talking about this evil injustice kind of conversation that we're talking about today. Um, and, there's, and Paul uses it sort of the same way. I do want to point out, though, that it is, is a good thing. The day of the Lord is a good thing for those who are righteous. And Joel 2, which we saw last week, was a good usage of the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, you know, the Spirit's going to get poured out, and there's going to be some blessings associated with the day of the Lord, too. So the whole point I'm trying to make is that when Jesus comes back and when justice is served, by definition, when justice is served, the righteous are going to be cheering for that, and the unrighteous are going to be not cheering for that because it's going to be actual justice. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul uses the idea of the day of the Lord, and then he uses it in a negative light to talk about people who are walking in darkness. So in verse 1, it says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, and remember, he's just talked in chapter 4 about the return of Christ. He just ended about how our hope is, Jesus Christ is going to come back, so shall we ever be with the Lord, and then comfort one another with these words. Then this is the next verse. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, that's another one you should go research if you want to research it, will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. What I love about this phrase, there is peace and security, reminds me of something we just saw earlier, right? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, right? This false sense of peace and security that comes when you are unrighteous. So Paul talks about it this way. There's peace and security. Sudden destruction will come upon them. Verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise 
you like a thief, for you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as people without children do. Oh, no, that's not what it says. <laughs> um, let, let us then not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So, and we'll stop there. You could keep reading if you wanted to, but um, the whole point here is that the people that live in darkness, the people that perpetuate darkness, who perpetuate injustice, when that day of the Lord comes, they're going to be surprised, and they're not going to like the outcome. And we are the opposite. We walk in the light. We look forward to the day of the Lord. We look forward to justice being served. So in light of that, what is the good news now? Let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. So the good news of, the, of justice is we know that perfect justice is not available now. So that's not the good news available now. But... Just because perfect justice isn't available now, does that keep us from seeking justice wherever and whenever we can? Nope. No, it cannot stop us. It's like we saw a couple weeks ago with the man who didn't want to love his wife because he was concerned he wasn't going to love her perfectly, right? Um, and then, you know, she gets upset with him because of that, right? <laughs> because just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it. And what we're going to see is God has called his people throughout all ages to pursue justice. And so we're going to start with looking at the law that he gave Israel. Remember, we started this morning by considering uh, Egypt as the typical unrighteous kingdom, unjust kingdom, and Israel being called out of that to be exemplified as the righteous or just kingdom. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, this is what God exhorts them to do. Verse 12, we're going to skip a, a little bit around. Uh, verse 12, it says, And now Israel, what does Yahweh your God require of you but to fear Yahweh your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of Yahweh, which I'm commanding you this day, you today for your good. So again, we've talked about this, how understanding the commandments of God as being for our benefit, it's embedded in this context, and it's in the context here of fearing God in the context of walking in all of his ways, loving him, serving him, that we find these verses in verse 17. For Yahweh your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes what? Justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt." Uh, just briefly on sojourners in that culture, sojourners did not really have rights. You know, nations would persecute people who came in uh, to their uh, borders. And Israel was meant to be a light to the nations. They were to be a kingdom of priests. They were to call people into God's presence. And so God is telling them, when someone comes in from out of the country, good, that's what we want. We want that. We want them to experience it. We want them to come into relationship with us and to come into relationship with God through them. And so that's why the, the sojourners often get mentioned, is because that was a unique circumstance. It was sort of like their version of outreach or evangelism. It was like national evangelism. They didn't really go out to the parts of the world and like go take Yahweh to the world. They were in one spot, and they attracted people to them. Sort of like uh, you know, lights at night attract bugs, stuff like that. That was sort of the idea, is, is the lights attract the bugs, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'm calling sojourners bugs, I guess. I don't know. But in the law, uh, there were several provisions to take care of people, to execute justice. Uh, for example, the tithe every third year was for the local poor. That's in Deuteronomy 26. Uh, there was the year of release every seventh year and the encouragement to lend to the poor in the year of release, even if you knew that that was going to be a debt that was forgiven. You were said, it was said very specifically, do not fret about it. God is the one who's going to take care of you. That's in Deuteronomy 15. Uh, unbelievably, the year of Jubilee every 50th year was designed to essentially reset the entire economy. That's in Leviticus 25. And I'm not sure that that ever actually happened. It's so radical, it's so wild uh, to think that that's what God would have wanted them to do, and we don't, we don't know if they ever did or not. But that was God's heart, was you have winners and losers over a 50-year period. Well, oh, we're going to reset the playing field. It's going to go back to zero. Really wild. And then Leviticus 19, this one's commonly understood. Leaving the corners and remnants of the field to be gleaned by the poor. 
Uh, and interestingly, that's in the context of that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, in Leviticus 19. So God set up so many things in Torah, in the law, to take care of the poor, to help Israel as a nation understand what does it look like to perpetuate justice on a national level. And these are the types of things that he set up. And we've, we've seen already that the prophets consistently called Israel and Judah back to this standard when they weren't living it. Um, so I don't think we need to go through all the prophetic words. We've already seen quite a few prophetic sections about this. So I want to skip real quickly to what the New Testament says about it. We don't have a ton of time, uh, but I do want to give a short list of what the early church did or was encouraged to do. Uh, the first one is in Acts chapter 6, uh, food distribution for the widows. Um, so that's eventually how uh, several people got called into ministry, including Stephen and Philip. Uh, in Acts chapter 11, there was a famine relief that Agabus went to Antioch, and he asked for um, them to send a famine relief to Jerusalem in Acts 11. In Philippians 4, it talks about how the Philippian church uh, sent relief to Paul. They supported Paul as a minister. Uh, he was not uh, a wealthy person, and he was working very hard, uh, this sort of side hustle, while he was preaching the gospel. And the Philippians helped relieve some of that. Uh, that was one of the things that the early church did. When I think about um, justice in a New Testament perspective, though, there are, there are two passages that really stick out to me. And again, we don't have time to unpack them today, but I encourage you to look at them this week. Um, the first one is in James chapter 2. It starts by talking about how we should not engage in partiality in our churches. So if you're a wealthy donor here to Compass, I'm not going to treat you any different than the person who comes off the street who's a homeless person. That's my job. That's our job as a community to treat people the same, whether they're homeless off the street or whether they're worth millions of dollars and want to give millions of dollars to Compass. We should treat them the exact same way. Show no partiality. And then later in James 2, he says he defines true, true faith as faith that takes action. And he specifically mentions as an example of that, taking care of poor brothers and sisters. And I think that's the, the piece I want to sort of tie, tie through here, is, is that it's not, it's not a noble thing just to be poor. That's not, that's not the point. The point is not that you know, being poor is some virtuous thing to be. The poor that we're talking about throughout the Bible, the poor that God was upset about people um, were the poor that were faithful. The poor that were in the community of Israel that were faithful, that were pleading their case to the people that should have been helping them and being rejected at the gates because of bribes. It's not just the poor of any nation. It's not just the poor of any community. We as a, as a church here at Compass, we're here in Louisville, Kentucky, we should care desperately about the poor here in Louisville and specifically our poor <laughs> brothers and sisters in the city of Louisville. That is what we're called to do. Now, can we send money to Africa with brothers and sisters in Africa? Can we send money to brothers and sisters in Europe or Asia or wherever? Yes, absolutely. But our primary concern from a justice perspective, I think, is the poor in our community, in our faith, you know, Christian brothers and sisters who are dealing with things. That's what James talks about. He talks about poor brothers and sisters, very specific. 1 John 3, same thing. He defines truly loving as love that takes action, like Jesus took action, right? By laying down his life at the cross. And then in the next breath, he says, and we should do this by sharing our world's good if we have it with the brothers and sisters in need. So he ties those two things together in 1 John 3, 16 through 18. And then lastly, I'm struck by the imagery in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, he's talking about those who will be entering into the kingdom of God. And he says that there's going to be sheep on one hand and goats on the other hand. And he says that the defining characteristic of the people who are sheep is not what they believed about him, not in that passage. It's not this, that, or the third. It is that they were marked by radical justice. They would give water and food to those who needed water and food. They would welcome strangers. They would clothe the needy. They would visit the prisoner. That's the kind of person who's going to be entering into the kingdom, someone who cares desperately about God's justice. And why is that? Because God cares about justice. He cares and he always has. And it's an attribute that's tied to his love. So there's a simple truth that underlies all of what I've said this morning, and it is that God can tell what we believe by how we act. 
He can tell whether we care about justice or not. He can tell if we love him or not. And God is just and he is love. We can strive to be imitators of our Father in all that we do. I want to close in Micah 6, 8. You don't have to go there. We're going to have it on the screen. But I just thought this was such a good synopsis of what we talked about this morning. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord, what does Yahweh require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is such a great synopsis of what we've seen this morning. He wants us to do justice. He wants us to execute justice. And I was thinking about how the day of the Lord is still a future event, right? Perfect justice is still a future event. The day of the Lord has not come in fullness yet. And so what that means is God is postponing his judgment. He's postponing that justice to a future time. And I think he's doing it because of grace and mercy. He wants more people to come in. He wants more people to have time to repent. He, he wants you know, all these things to happen in the fullness of time. But in the meantime, what can we do? Who, is, who are the ones who are to seek justice on God's behalf now? We're the ones who are called to do that. He's not going to be executing total justice. But we can mirror his heart and his will for this dying world by executing justice in our local communities. And so in that way, we can participate in God's goodness in everything that we do. We are to reconcile others back to God and show others what his love is all about. And we can do that by accepting that invitation that God is giving us this morning to be people of justice, to care about the needs of people who are less fortunate than us, especially our brothers and sisters. So we are called to be kingdom people. We are called to be people of justice. Well, if you would all stand with us to close out the service. Thank you.
doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. Thank you for coming this morning, friends. Uh, don't forget to pick your kiddos up down the hall. And then would you come back and spend some time with us after the service? Uh, I know I'm, I'm starving, and I hope you'll have a snack with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. May you walk forward this week in God's love and in his justice. Amen.